Welcome back to the G Lab. Last time we left, we were talking about the things that natural selection needs in order to work. You need genetic variation. You need some competition. So you've got winners and losers. And the winners then are the ones that are able to survive and then reproduce. So the winners are the ones that we consider what we call the fittest. They are most fit for their environment. So how does this actually change a species over time? Well, the answer is nature applies what we call selective pressure. So selective pressure. Well, what is selective pressure? It comes in a, in a number of varieties. We'll get to what it, the definition, definition is in a minute. So uh, let's take a look at the example of, say, ancestral giraffes, giraffes of uh, various neck lengths. Some may have had short, short necks, some medium, some long. And if you actually made a graph then of the length of the giraffe's neck and the number of animals that actually had a neck that long, you could make a graph that looks something like this. Most giraffes had probably a medium neck, a few had shorter necks, and a few had longer necks. Now if the food source was up high and hard to reach, what you might have is some pressure on the ones with shorter necks, some pressure to survive. So what happens is if you have some pressure on the shorter neck giraffes, they're not going to survive. The ones that do survive are going to be the ones with the longer necks, and so the generations after that selective event are going to have longer necks. Now, this may take many, many generations to get it to shift this much, but you can think of it a bit like a bump in the carpet. If there's a bump in the carpet and you push on one side of it, it doesn't just go away. It just kind of shifts over a little bit. And so if you put pressure on short-necked giraffes, it will shift the population so the longer-necked giraffes survive, reproduce, and have a long-necked giraffe offspring. This is um, what we call directional selective pressure. So directional pressure because it moves the population in a certain direction. Okay, A lot of different traits you could use besides, of course, length of neck. You could use the, um, the darkness of fur or the uh, amount of aggression or any kind of uh, structural or behavioral trait that any animal has. It also works with uh, with plants. Speaking of plants, let's look at another kind of selective selective pressure with uh, trees, for instance. Let's imagine here is a um, here's a fir tree, let's say, and uh, the height of that fir tree. We'll graph that along here. Most fir trees are sort of a medium height. Some are really tall. Some are really short. And um, but most of them are kind of in that medium height range. If you were to measure a tree at the, a given age and given it um, similar and growing environments. Well, if a tree is too short, of course, it can't um, reach the sunlight very well, especially if it's not forest, so it has less chance of surviving. If a tree is really tall, on the other hand, that may be a disadvantage. It may stick up uh, too high above the other trees in the forest of the same age, and you may end up with a pretty good little lightning rod. Maybe it would get struck by lightning more often. Maybe wind would affect it more because it's sticking up above the canopy of the other trees. Um, perhaps it's very difficult for a tree like uh, that's that tall to get water up to the top. So a variety of problems could, could come because your tree is too tall. So now, instead of pressing just on one side of our carpet bump, we're now pressing on both sides. You don't want to be too short. You don't want to be too tall as a tree. So what happens if you press on both sides of this at the same time? What you end up with is selection against the extremes, and that means that your population is going to stabilize and become even more homogenous. In other words, very, very similar to each uh, to the other members of the species. And this is what we call a stabilizing pressure. The idea here is, that, of course, that um, it actually makes the population even more stable because the ones in the center are the ones that have a much, much more likelihood of survival. Finally, where else could we press on this bump besides just on one side or on both sides? Well, we could press right in the middle. So let's take a look at uh, hummingbirds and their length of the beak. So hummingbirds have, some have uh, sh maybe uh, shorter, some have longer, but most hummingbirds of a given species, and there are hundreds of species of hummingbirds, most uh, hummingbirds in a given species are going to have sort of a, a similar length neck. Now, it just so happens that the length of the beak actually corresponds to the flowers in the area and the shape of the flowers and the depth of the flowers. And so if you had a die-off, like an extinction perhaps, of a certain type of flower that was really um, 
well fit to the, the beak of a medium-sized beak, uh, you might have other flowers that uh, then would take over in its, in its place. So what you might end up with is less chance of, um, of a hummingbird with a medium-length beak, beak surviving, but maybe the ones with the smaller beak or a larger beak have a decent time surviving. So for instance, if you have a long beak, you're going to have better luck getting into a long, skinny flower like this one here. And if you have a short beak, you're actually going to have a better luck at getting into a, um, a shorter flower like this. You can imagine a very long beak or even a medium-sized beak on these guys would be difficult to aim, especially if the wind is moving the flowers around a little bit. Very difficult to aim, uh, whereas a short beak would be much better. So in this case, uh, in, a, in an environment where the, the flowers that are sort of medium depth uh, go extinct or are not as prevalent, you then have someone is essentially pushing down on the middle of the carpet bump and you end up with two very different types of birds which may eventually then diverge into a couple of different species. Um, and what you'd have there is some speciation going on. So we, we call this one here, this is disruptive pressure. This is uh, pressure that disrupts the um, what some might term the balance of nature, which is a bit of a myth, but the uh, the process then disrupts that and, and forces birds uh, to uh, forces birds one way or the other essentially. Now one a bird can't really adapt itself. It can't try and grow a beak and then pass that on to its its gener its uh, the next generation of offspring. If it doesn't have the right size beak, it's less likely to live. It's, it's going to die and probably not reproduce. The ones that do have a, a, a beak that fits a flower that's available, those will survive more likely and pass that trait on to the next generation. So selective pressure, if we wanted to summarize what that really means, it's anything that reduces the survival and reproduction of only a portion of a population. In other words, something that makes a loser. But it also makes a winner, and the winners are the ones that then survive and reproduce and pass that on. So you have directional pressure, you have stabilizing pressure, and finally you have disruptive pressure. Selective pressure, that's how you can end up with species that change over time, or even a species that can then diverge into two separate species.